So today we're going to talk about bundle branch blocks. In this video, we'll go over how to diagnose and distinguish a right from a left bundle branch block. We'll also talk about the concept of the secondary repolarization abnormality. In other words, the abnormal T wave and ST segment pattern that you can sometimes see in patients who have long-standing hypertrophy and which you'll always see in patients who have bundle branch blocks. So let's go ahead and get started. Here's our systematic method again. I'm showing you this just to give you an idea of where in this sequence we go about diagnosing bundle branch blocks. So when I read an EKG, after I've done rate and looked at the PR interval, I look at the QRS duration. Now, if my QRS is wider than three small boxes or 120 milliseconds, I call it wide. This is usually because of a bundle branch block. The immediate next question I ask myself is, do I have a right or a left bundle branch block? So to answer this question, I look at lead V1 to figure it out. I'll explain in a minute how I go about doing this. And after I've identified my bundle branch block, I come back and finish looking at the intervals. So to understand bundle branch blocks, let's take a look at the normal sequence of ventricular activation. Here's our impulse starting at the sinus node. It spreads across the atria to cause atrial depolarization, which is represented by our P wave. Now following a brief AV conduction delay, the impulse quickly travels down the specialized conducting fibers of the his purkinje system, which allow it to rapidly transmit across both ventricles, producing simultaneous depolarization of both chambers. Here's the impulse running down the right bundle branch to cause right-sided depolarization. And here it is simultaneously speeding down the left bundle branch, which is actually comprised of two fascicles. Now because we have a functioning his purkinje system, depolarization of both ventricles occurs quickly, usually within 80 milliseconds. This gives us a QRS complex that's nice and narrow. Now let's say your right bundle branch stopped working. What do you think would happen? Would the right ventricle depolarize at all? Where would it get the impulse from? So yes, in a right bundle branch block, the right ventricle still depolarizes, but without his Purkinje innervation, the impulse relies on slow conduction through the myocytes to make it to the right side. So here's the impulse traveling down the left side in its Porsche, and here it is finally making its way through the right side on a Huffy. So in a bundle branch block, because it takes longer for the ventricles to completely depolarize, we end up with a QRS complex that's wide. Now the easiest way to distinguish a right bundle branch block from a left bundle branch block is to just think about what's going on within the QRS complex. So the ventricle that has intact his Purkinje innervation in this case, the left ventricle will completely finish depolarizing within 80 to 100 milliseconds. The block ventricle, on the other hand, will take much longer to finish depolarizing, and so what you see at the end of the QRS complex reflects the block ventricle's depolarization. What this means is that in a bundle branch block, the block ventricle always depolarizes last. So to figure out if a wide QRS complex represents a right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block, all you have to do is figure out which ventricle is depolarizing at the end. For those of you who are learning vectors, this is the concept behind the terminal QRS vector. So for bundle branch blocks, the best lead to look in is lead V1, which is located on the right side. Now, because the right ventricle sits anteriorly underneath V1, if you see a positive QRS deflection in lead V1, it tells you that you're looking at depolarization of the right ventricle. I'll say that one more time. So because V1, sits over the right ventricle. If you see a positive QRS deflection in lead V1, it tells you that you're looking at right ventricular depolarization. Now on the other hand, if you see a negative QRS deflection in lead V1, it indicates depolarization of the left ventricle, which has more mass oriented more posteriorly. So let's look at this wide QRS complex in lead V1. So looking at it, we can see that the terminal deflection is positive. And so that tells us that the right ventricle is depolarizing last. Thus, in this case, the right ventricle is our blocked ventricle, which means we have a right bundle branch block. Now let's look at another wide QRS complex in lead V1. Now, would you call this a right or a left bundle branch block? Well, because the end of the QRS complex is negative, we know that the left ventricle is depolarizing last, which means that this is a left bundle branch block. Now most left bundle branch blocks tend to look almost completely negative in lead V1, kind of like this one, 
while most right bundle branch blocks have a rabbit ear kind of an appearance. Okay, let's look at another wide QRS in lead V1. Is this a right or a left bundle branch block? Well, the whole thing here is positive, including the terminal QRS, and so this is a right bundle branch block. Okay, one more. Is this a right or a left bundle branch block? Good. This is a right bundle. All right, last one. Is this a right or a left bundle branch block? So if we pretend that a QRS complex like this is physiologically possible, this would be a left bundle branch block since the terminal deflection is negative. Now, why is all of this important? Well, a wide QRS is one of the most abnormal things you can find on an EKG. In fact, in general, the wider the QRS complex, the more likely it is that the patient has significant structural heart disease. Now, remember that a wide QRS is wider than 0.12 seconds, while a normal QRS duration is less than 0.1 seconds. When the QRS duration is in this intermediate zone between 0.1 seconds and 0.12 seconds, I call it an intraventricular conduction delay. Patients who have QRS durations that are even in this intermediate range are more likely to have abnormal things going on, for example, chronic hypertensive heart disease. Now you might hear people use the term incomplete bundle branch block. This is basically saying the same thing. An incomplete right bundle branch block, for example, looks like a right bundle and has characteristic rabbit ears in V1, but it isn't quite wide enough to be a right bundle. I should also mention that fascicular blocks are something totally different, which we'll talk about later. Now, right bundle branch blocks are usually caused by things that produce right heart pathology. So, for example, pulmonary hypertension of any etiology, chronic lung disease, congenital heart disease, valvular heart disease, pulmonary embolism. Other potential causes of right bundle branch block include degeneration of the conduction system, which occurs in some elderly patients, and coronary artery disease, acute or chronic. Sometimes right bundle branch block can even be seen in patients with normal hearts. Now, left bundle branch block, on the other hand, almost always indicates something abnormal. Common causes include cardiomyopathy due to any number of etiologies, advanced hypertensive heart disease, valvular heart disease, and coronary artery disease, acute or chronic. You can also sometimes see left bundle branch block due to degeneration of the conduction system in some elderly patients. Now with bundle branch blocks, the forces of depolarization tend to be exaggerated in the direction of the blocked ventricle. This is because depolarization occurs in a different direction as the impulse moves through the block side. Also, because the blocked ventricle takes longer to depolarize, a lot of its forces are largely unopposed by the other ventricle. As a result, patients with left bundle branch blocks have QRS complexes that are very positive in leads depicting the left ventricle, for example, leads V5, V6, and AVL. For this reason, if you have a left bundle branch block, you can't diagnose left ventricular hypertrophy using voltage criteria since the voltage is already expected to be high in these leads. I'll say that again. So because a left bundle branch block will make your voltage look high in the lateral leads, you really can't diagnose LVH using voltage criteria. Also, in a left bundle branch block, the axis can be normal, horizontal, or leftward. Now, on the other hand, patients with right bundle branch block have QRS complexes that tend to be more positive in leads depicting the right ventricle, especially lead V1. Thus, if you have a right bundle branch block, you really can't call something RVH using voltage criteria. Now, with a right bundle branch block, the axis is usually pretty normal. It can be a little bit vertical, but it's not usually rightward. All right, enough talk. Now let's go ahead and look at a 12 lead EKG. So walking through this EKG systematically, I can see that the rate is about 100 beats per minute. There is a normal P wave before every QRS complex and a QRS after every P wave. And so I can call the rhythm normal sinus rhythm. Now looking at my intervals, the PR interval looks to be less than five small boxes. And so I'll call it normal. The QRS duration on the other hand is pretty wide it's definitely wider than three small boxes. And so that means we have a bundle branch block. Now to figure out if it's a right or a left bundle branch block, all we have to do is look here in lead V1. So looking at this QRS complex, what do you think we have here? Is this a right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block? So because the end of this QRS complex is positive, this is a right bundle branch block. 
Now, most ripe under branch blocks look very positive like this one. You can see that the two peaks on this QRS complex kind of resemble deformed rabbit ears, though I should mention that not all ripe bundle branch blocks have rabbit ears. Now you'll notice that the QRS complex ends here at the baseline, and everything after this point is ST segment and T wave. Notice that the ST segment is depressed and the T wave is inverted. In fact, many of these ST segments look pretty depressed. So what's going on here? Do these ST segments and T waves represent cardiac ischemia? So actually, in this case, what we're seeing here is what is known as a secondary repolarization abnormality. When you have a bundle branch block, you'll always see abnormal repolarization patterns like this one because depolarization occurs in an abnormal way. And so when we call something a secondary repolarization abnormality, what we're saying is that the abnormal ST segments and T waves that we're looking at are actually more benign. They're occurring secondary to the bundle branch block. Now this is in contrast to a primary T wave abnormality or a primary ST segment abnormality, which indicate abnormal T waves or ST segments that reflect a primary process, for example, an acute MI. I should point out that we can't rule out cardiac ischemia on the CKG, and if anything, the secondary repolarization changes that we see with bundle branch blocks make it harder to diagnose MI. That said, having a prior EKG for comparison and knowing the general appearance of secondary repolarization changes will help you when you're trying to figure out if you're looking at just another secondary repolarization abnormality or if you're looking at something abnormal such as an MI. Secondary repolarization abnormalities are always seen when you have a bundle branch block and they're sometimes seen when you have long-standing ventricular hypertrophy, though they look a little bit different. Now it's important to mention that you should be completely sure that you're not missing something abnormal like ACS before you call something a secondary repolarization abnormality. So with secondary repolarization abnormality, if you have a bundle branch block and you're looking at a lead and you see a monophasic QRS complex that looks all positive, you expect the ST segment and T wave to point away from it. And so here you should expect to see ST segment depression and T wave inversion following a very positive QRS complex. This is a very predictable thing. Now on the other hand, if you have a monophasic QRS complex that's all negative, you expect the ST segments and T waves to point in the opposite direction. And so over here, you should expect to see ST elevation and an upright T wave. Now you can imagine that this would make it harder to diagnose an ST elevation MI in a patient who has a left bundle branch block where the QRS complexes look very negative in the right precordial leads. Now for those of you who are learning vectors, the vector way of describing what we're saying here is that if you were to draw vectors representing the T wave and the ST segments, they would point opposite to the QRS vector. Now when your wide QRS complex is biphasic like this one, it's harder to predict which way the ST segments and T waves will point. But usually the secondary repolarization abnormality points opposite to the terminal portion of the QRS complex. And so in this case, because the end of the QRS complex is positive, you'll usually see ST depression and T wave inversion, but it's not very predictable. And when your wide QRS complex is triphasic, it's even harder to predict which way the secondary repolarization abnormality will point. And so in this case, because the end of the QRS complex is negative, you're more likely to see ST elevation and upright T wave. But this is not predictable at all, and it's not worth jumping to any conclusions over. Now, let's say we drew a wide QRS complex that looks like this. What would you expect your ST segments and T waves to look like? So because the QRS is all negative, we expect the ST segments and T waves to point away from it. And so we expect to see ST elevation in a tall T wave. Now, is this a predictable thing? Yes, this is very predictable. Now, how about I draw a wide QRS complex that looks like this? What do you expect the ST segments and T waves to look like? Is it predictable? So because the terminal QRS deflection is negative, we expect the ST segment and T wave to point away from it. And so we'll usually see ST elevation and an upright T wave, but it's not totally predictable. Okay, one more. What do you expect the ST segments and T waves to look like? Is it predictable? So you'd expect to see ST depressions and T wave inversions, but again, it's not very predictable. Okay, last one. What do you expect the ST segments and T waves to look like here? So if a QRS complex like this was physiologically possible, you might expect to see an upright T wave and ST segment. 
but it's definitely not predictable. And so you might have a flat one, you might have a negative one, really it's anyone's guess. So coming back to this last EKG we looked at, let's carefully look lead by lead and ask ourselves if these ST segment and T wave changes look expected or unexpected. So let's start with the limb leads. Again, I want you to carefully look at the QRS complex in each of these leads and ask yourself if the ST segment and T wave changes that follow it are typical of a secondary repolarization abnormality. Go ahead and hit pause. So looking at the limb leads, for the most part, these ST segment and T wave changes are typical of a secondary repolarization abnormality. The changes in lead 2 aren't 100% characteristic, but it's not a big deal if it's off in one lead. And for those of you who drew the vectors, you'll notice that the frontal plane QRS vector is oriented rightward, consistent with a right axis deviation, while the T wave and ST segment vectors point nearly opposite to it on the left side. This is typical of a secondary repolarization abnormality from a bundle branch block. Now let's look at the precordial leads. So are these ST segment and T wave changes expected or unexpected? Look carefully in each lead. Go ahead and hit pause. So you'll see that for the most part, these ST segment and T wave changes are typical of a secondary repolarization abnormality. The QRS is oriented anteriorly and it's very positive in the right precordial leads. It makes sense then that this is where you see the most negative ST segments and T waves. Now I should mention again that we can't rule out something like acute MI or acute pulmonary embolism with this EKG, but we can at least say with confidence that the ST segment and T wave changes that we see here are typical of a secondary repolarization from a bundle branch block. Okay, this next EKG is of a patient who presents with chest pain. Now let's say she has a left bundle branch block at baseline, but you don't have a prior EKG for comparison. And so what I want you to do is to look carefully at each of these leads and try to figure out if the ST segment and T wave changes that we see are expected or unexpected. And so let's start with the precordial leads. Go ahead and hit pause. So looking carefully at each of these precordial leads, you can see that for the most part, these ST segment and T wave changes are typical of a secondary repolarization abnormality from a bundle branch block. Now let's look at the limb leads. Same question, are these ST segment and T wave changes expected or unexpected? Go ahead and hit pause. So if you look carefully at each of these limb leads, you might have noticed that the T waves don't exactly point where you'd expect them to point. For example, in lead 3, the entire QRS complex, including the terminal part, is very negative. That means we'd expect to see ST elevation and an upright T wave here. Instead, you can see that we have unexpected T wave inversions. And if you looked in lead AVF, you could see that the same thing is going on. So this is an example of a primary T wave abnormality. In other words, this EKG has abnormal T wave inversions in the inferior leads, in this case due to an acute MI. So if anyone tells you that you can't diagnose signs of acute MI in a patient who has a left bundle branch block, be sure to correct them. Now there's also what we call a primary STT abnormality here. So in a bundle branch block, the ST segments and T waves are supposed to point in the same direction. If they don't, we call it a primary STT abnormality, which can also represent an abnormal process similar to a primary T wave abnormality. Now if you drew the vectors for this one, go ahead and hit pause to see what they should look like. Now if all that went over your head, don't worry about it. Really the only thing that's important here is that you have a good understanding of what ST segments and T waves are expected to look like when you have a bundle branch block. Okay, I want to show you one last EKG just to give you an idea of what Wolf-Parkinson-White pre-excitation looks like. So normally, after atrial depolarization, there's a brief conduction delay at the level of the AV node and proximal His bundle before the impulse can make it to the ventricles. Now with pre-excitation, an accessory pathway permits the impulse to bypass the AV node and start activating a portion of the ventricles early. As a result, the PR interval becomes shorter and the beginning of the QRS complex might appear slurred or notched. We call this a delta wave. Also, the whole QRS complex becomes wider. Patients with pre-excitation syndromes are at risk of developing tachyarrhythmias, which we'll talk about in another video. Okay, let's go ahead and stop there. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you got a good handle on bundle branch blocks as well as secondary repolarization abnormalities. Now, if you're interested in learning more about fascicular blocks, which are also known as hemi blocks, be sure to check out the brief optional video I've put together on them. So until next time, stay systematic.